Welcome to the podcast for the West Side Church of Christ that meets in Killeen, Texas. Today we bring you another practical lesson from God's inspired word, the Bible. Good evening. It's good to see you all here. I'm honored once again to be up here preaching to you tonight. I give my thanks to Mike for setting this year's lectures up. What I want to talk to you about tonight is this idea of looking to and knowing that something great lies beyond this life that is a vapor. So many of you have heard me say that I love history, and that's true. I mean, it was pretty much my favorite subject in school, and I still sometimes will go back and read my history books for fun. And I've also started watching historical documentaries because it really appeals to me. So I've kind of built up my top five fave moments in history, if you will. And one of them is the Battle of Bunker Hill. This was fought during the first sieges of the American Revolutionary War. Previously, the colonists and the British had fought at Lexington and Concord. And the British and the colonists are now in Charlestown, Massachusetts. I'm sure y'all remember how this war went, but I want to give you a refresher. I want to give you a summarized version of the event. Three attempts were made. The first two ended poorly for the British. The first was aimed at the left flank of the Americans, and this failed, as British troops had difficulty maintaining marching formation through waist-high wheat fields and were weighed down by unnecessary gear. The Americans waited till the British were within 50 paces of their position before firing at the British, who exposed too many men in the front line. The second ended very much the same way as the first. However, the third and final attempt favored the British. The Americans had ran out of ammo, plus on two hills, Reed's Hill, there were 700 to 800 men, and then on Bunker Hill, there was only 150 men left. Even in the midst of, the, of defeat, some of these men stood their ground, completely changing the battle from long range to close range, as those whose muskets were equipped with a bayonet still fought, which allowed the Americans to recover most of their wounded. This again is one of my favorite events to read about. But the entirety of it, as far as what uniforms did they wear and what caliber of ammunition did their guns take, I don't believe that's beneficial to us. But I do think that there are some things we can take away from it. And so I've got three points I wanna look at. The first point is study. The next point is unite. The third and final point is fight. 2 Timothy 2.15 Do your best to present yourself to God as one approved, a worker who has no need to be ashamed, rightly handling the word of truth. Before you start fighting, it pays to study the battleground, your enemy, and areas of advantage. There are books written for this purpose. The Art of War, for example, is a book written about military strategy. For us as Christians, it's even more important. That's our life of service to God. How can we know what God wants us to do and even preach God's word if we don't know uh, what it says and don't, under, and don't study for ourselves and get a deep understanding of his word. And there are many ways you could go about this. Here's a few. You could go to a Bible study, like we are having tonight. Or have a youth study. Back in California, there were lots of those. And here as well. And some of them I don't even know about. You could go to a group gathering. Well, sometimes the excuse is, oh, well, I don't like large groups, or I'm not a people's person. Come up with an excuse that, if we're really being honest with ourselves, gives you 
the liberty to do whatever you want and nor ignore what God's word says. Don't get me wrong, we all have lives. Some of us work late, and some of us maybe work all day. But again, let's be honest with ourselves. When have you ever left a study or anything spiritual and not left and not have left uplifted? There's a reason why we are to study. Psalm 1 2. But his delight is in the law of the Lord, and on his law he meditates day and night. Day and night. So from the time I get up to the time I go to sleep, God's word is always on my mind. And so hopefully while we're studying, we're also putting into, per putting into practice what we've learned. Why? Well, it helps us spiritually, mentally, and emotionally. But overall, it just makes us a better person to be around. Practice, practice makes perfect. While yes, we will never be perfect, we still and should be striving to be perfect as best we can. Jesus certainly took this to a whole new level, as he always does. Matthew 4, 1 through 11, please turn there. Matthew 4, 1 through 11. Just prior to this, Jesus goes down to the Jordan to be baptized. In chapter 3, John the Baptist was baptizing people, and the Pharisees and the Sadducees came, and Jesus sees them, or excuse me, John sees them, and hammers them with his first few words. It says in chapter 3, verse 7, you brood of vipers, who warned you to flee from the, from the wrath to come? Shortly thereafter, Jesus is baptized. Now here in chapter 4, Jesus has been led into the wilderness, and he's been fasting 40 days and 40 nights. So starting at verse 1 of chapter 4, Then Jesus was led up by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. And after fasting forty days and forty nights, he was hungry. And the tempter came and said to him, If you are the Son of God, command these stones to become loaves of bread. But he answered, It is written, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. Then the devil took him to the holy city and sent him and set him on the pinnacle of the temple. And he said to him, If you are the Son of God, Throw yourself down, for it is written, He will command his angels concerning you, and on their hands they will bear you up, lest you strike your foot against the stone. Jesus said to him, Again it is written, You shall not put the Lord your God to the test. Again the devil took him to a very high mountain, and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their glory. And he said to him, all of these I will give you, if you will fall down and worship me. Then Jesus said to him, Be gone, Satan, for it is written, You shall worship the Lord your God, and him only shall you serve. Then the devil left him, and behold, the angels came and were ministering to him. We might look at this and go, Yeah, okay, well, he was God in the form of a man. And I'm just human. Well, guess what? Jesus was a man too. And we've discussed this before, right? 100% human and 100% man. Even though those numbers don't work out, it's true. 100% both. And so this means that he felt everything you and I feel and ever will feel. And if you look at all the temptations, all of them had to do with Jesus being a man, but also being all-powerful. But yet, he combated all of that with Scripture. How many of us could do that effectively? But another thing in talking about studying and practicing is that we should never be afraid to ask questions. Questions are helpful and useful in so many ways. And that's why I love our discussion period. Because talking about God's word and getting different perspectives and thoughts 
helps each other grow. We're building each other up in love, to quote Ephesians 4.16. But it helps us get a better understanding of what we're studying and doing on a regular day-to-day -day basis. Before the battle took place, both sides discussed their plans, as would any army. But step out of reality real quick and, and let's step into the what if. Could you imagine how disorganized and maybe, maybe just how plain weird the war would have been had there not been plans and steps that had to happen? It would have been something to behold. But both sides had something in common. They both were united in what they were doing, even though they were on opposing sides. Each side showed unity in what they were doing. Flip over to Ephesians 4. Ephesians 4, we're going to read 1 through 16. This is Paul speaking here. And it says, I therefore, a prisoner for the Lord, urge you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling to which you have been called, with all humility and gentleness, with patience, bearing with one another in love, eager to maintain the unity of the Spirit and the bond of peace. There is one body and one spirit, just as you were called to the one hope that belongs to your call. One Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is over all and through all and in all. But grace was given to each one of us according to the measure of Christ's gift. Therefore, it says, when he ascended on high, he led a host of captives, and he gave gifts to men. And saying he ascended, what does it mean but that he had also descended into the lower regions, the earth? He who descended is the one who also ascended, far above all the heavens, that he might fill all things. And he gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the shepherds and teachers to equip the saints for the work of ministry, for building up the body of Christ until we all attain to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God, to mature manhood, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ, so that we may no longer be children tossed to and fro by the waves and carried about by every wind of doctrine, by human cunning, by craftiness and deceitful schemes. Rather, speaking the truth in love, we are to grow up in every way into him who is the head, into Christ, from whom the whole body joined and held together by every joint joint with which it is equipped when each part is working properly makes the body grow so that it builds itself up in love. Regardless of how tactical the orders of the British generals were, the soldiers marched together and did what they were commanded. Same with the Americans. Each man did their part. And it paid off and worked well the first two attempts that were made at them. The, the idea, excuse me, of unity is written throughout the New Testament, especially by Paul, who often encouraged churches to do what is right. And in th these verses, we read, builds itself, the body, up in love. How do you do that? Well, remember, this goes back to our first point, study. But I think that this should also go deeper than what we think this can mean. Because maybe we think unity. Oh yeah, I go to church with my brothers and sisters in Christ on Sunday and Wednesday. Unity. Yes, 100% agree that that is a part of unity. And it's a big part, yeah. But I think this should be personal too. Because think about this, how do you have unity if you, as the individual, does not know how to love, does not know how to be joyful, be peaceful, be patient. The list goes on. Just read Galatians 5, where Paul talks about the fruit of the Spirit. And so a lot of that requires self-examination to see if we have these traits. Ephesians 4.24, it says, 
and put on the new self, create after the likeness of God in true righteousness and holiness. Just before this, Paul talks about not walking as the Gentiles do. And for us, that would be the world. But he talks about how they become callous and they're greedy and they're practicing every kind of impurity. Then in Colossians chapter 3, 12 through 14, he talks about putting on the new self. But before he gets into that, he actually kind of starts off with an intro and says, okay, you need to put these things away, malice, envy, and all those, and all those things. And so now I want us to look at Colossians chapter 3, 12 through 14. So flip over there. Colossians chapter 3. 12 through 14. He says, Put on then as God's chosen ones, holy and beloved, compassionate hearts, kindness, humility, meekness, and patience, bearing with one another, and if one has a complaint against another, forgiving each other, as the Lord has forgiven you, so you also must forgive. And above all these, put on love, which binds everything together in perfect harmony. How easy is it to forgive a stranger? How easy is it for you to bear with your brother or sister? This is what unity is about, making you uncomfortable. Because if you don't feel comfortable having those uncomfortable conversations with your brothers and sisters in Christ, then that's a problem. And we better step back and look at ourselves and find where we're lacking. All of this, again, goes back to studying, but back to the British. While their marching campaign the first two times was futile, because remember, they exposed too many men in the front line, they still kept going. They didn't give up. They were persistent. It's really hard to push a car by yourself. But you get a few more people, and that car starts to move. God created the church for us, for each other. Because when you have that one member who is hurting, the whole church feels it. And then we do our best to provide assistance. And that's the beauty of unity. Back to Ephesians. I'm going to look at Ephesians 5, 15 through 16. It says, Look carefully then how you walk, not as unwise, but as wise making best use of the time because the days are evil. I'm, rem I'm reminded of the Georgetown singing we went to last year. Lots of people together in one place for one reason, to praise God. The whole room was filled with voices, and I would sometimes stop just to listen, and it was amazing. I mean, it was, it was something because I got goosebumps just listening to all those voices. And back in California, in Dublin, Nico, Renee, and I, we would attend uh, this youth study where lots of young people, but also teens and college students, we would gather together and we would study, and then we would gather together in the auditorium and we would sing. And I couldn't tell you exactly how many people there were in that auditorium, but it was enough to give you goosebumps and make the hair stand up on the back of your neck. And it's amazing to see that. Unity could be as simple as that, singing together. But once again, unity can take many forms. It can be how we act with one another, but it could also be how we act as a whole, as a church. Sometimes the cares of the world, or maybe even just life in general, gets in the way. And we let it weigh us down. We might fall, but again, we've got each other to lift one another up. And after we're up, it's back to the fight. Exodus 14.14. 14. Flip over there real quick. Exodus 14.14. 14. And it says, the Lord will fight for you. 
and you have only to be silent. The fight will be tough. And part of this affects us mentally. Think about this for a second. The struggles you and I go through are struggles that we create for ourselves without even realizing it. There's always those temptations and challenges we face daily. But all that baggage we bring is what will weigh you down. It's like walking through mud. With each step you take, you sink deeper and deeper. Until finally, maybe our conscious goes, Hey buddy, look, we're really struggling here. So let's get back on track. Remember I said that these points connect back to each other. Well, here we go. Here's another example that connects back to unite. We would be foolish to think that I can do this by myself. I don't need your help. I got this. I think sometimes people use the excuse that, oh, well, this is for the glory of God, or this is for God's kingdom. I want us to turn to 1 Samuel chapter 13. We're going to look at verses 8, uh, excuse me, 8 through 14. So Samuel, in the previous chapter, um, he kind of gave a farewell to the people of Israel. But he also kind of scares the living daylights out of them too. It says in, chap in verse 8 of chapter 12 that he called upon the Lord... And the Lord sent thunder and rain that day. This is right after he lets them know that, hey, y'all have done all these bad things because you asked for a king. Now, in chapter 13, Saul is getting ready to fight the Philistines. And it says in verse 6 of chapter 13 that when the men of Israel saw that they were in trouble, what did they do? They hid themselves. Now Saul has been waiting seven days for Samuel to return, but he hasn't. So let's read, starting in verse 8 of chapter 13. It says, He waited seven days, the time appointed by Samuel. But Samuel did not come to Gilgal, and the people were scattering from him. So Saul said, Bring the burnt offering here to me, and the peace offerings. And he offered the burnt offering. As soon as he had finished, offering the burnt offering, behold, Samuel came. And Saul went out to meet him and greet him. Samuel said, What have you done? And Saul said, When I saw that the people were scattering from me, and that you did not come within the days appointed, and that the Philistines had mustered at Michmash, I said, Now the Philistines will come down against me at Gilgal. I have not sought the favor of the Lord. So I forced myself and offered the burnt offering. And Samuel said to Saul, You have done foolishly. You have not kept the command of the Lord your God, with which he commanded you. For then the Lord would have established your kingdom over Israel forever. But now your kingdom shall not continue. The Lord has sought after a man after his own heart. And the Lord has commanded him to be prince over his people because you have not kept what the Lord commanded you. We as human beings do not always come up with the best solutions to our problems. Instead of going to God, we turn to man-made books and even yoga if you're into that. But the problem with those things is it offers a momentary solution. Now, it's not to say that you should never read those types of books. But if you never put the things you read into practice, why even bother with them in the first place? And so it will never 100% rid you of a struggle or a challenge till you meet it head on and say, no, I'm done. I want to move forward. Fighting also comes through experience. Back in California, when I was about nine years old, um, I went into a Brazilian martial arts class mm -hmm. called Capoeira. In this martial arts class, every move you make is supposed to, fly, supposed to flow in and out of each other. 
almost like you're dancing. Which is actually what the martial arts is, um, is based off of and disguised as. And so the first thing you're ever going to learn is footwork. And I can't tell you how important footwork is in this martial arts. Because depending on where your feet are, that determines whether or not you get your feet swept from underneath you. And I can tell you from experience that that hurts a lot. It hurts like crazy. And for us as Christians, our footwork is reading God's word. That determines how you'll stand up to the world. Back over to Ephesians. I want to look at Ephesians chapter 6. We're going to read verses 10 through 17. It says, Finally, be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might. Put on the whole armor of God, that you may be able to stand against the schemes of the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God, that you may be able to withstand in the evil day, having done all to stand firm. Stand, therefore, having fastened on the belt of truth, and having put on the breastplate of righteousness, and as shoes for your feet, having put on the readiness given by the gospel of peace. In all circumstances, take up the shield of faith, with which you can extinguish all the flaming darts of the evil one. And take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. I love you all so much. You all are the perfect example of unity and love. And we just got done, finished talking about unity and its purpose. When I was 9 or 10, actually I think when I was 8 years old, um, I would get mad. You know, I'm not saying like, you know, I would have a little burst of anger. I mean mad. Which was funny because most people that saw me and interacted with me outside of the house always said I was this sweet, nice little boy. But back at home, I'd have a cute little smile across, the, across my face for one second, then the next my parents just wanted to beat the snot out of me with love, with love. No matter how hard you fight, you will never, ever beat love. And there's a reason love binds all things together, because it's unbreakable. At my highest moment of anger, just a quick, I love you, was all that was needed. It completely changes the battle, just like the battle changed from long range to close range. The world fights out of hatred. God fights out of love for his creation and wants us to be reconciled back to him. Flip over to Proverbs real quick. Proverbs chapter 10. Look at verse 12 there. It says, Hatred stirs up strife. But love covers all offenses. And then going from there, flip over to Song of Solomon. Look at chapter 8, verse 7. It says, Many waters cannot quench love, neither can floods drown it. Then once more, going over to the New Testament, go to 1 John, chapter 4. Look at verse 7 through 9. It says, Beloved, let us love one another. For love is from God, and whoever loves has been born of God and knows God. Anyone who does not love does not know God, because God is love. In this love of God was made manifest among us, that God sent his only Son into the world so that we might live through him. The Americans were fighting for something, something that the entirety of it didn't come to pass until much later. 
they fought for many reasons, but I don't want to get into all that. But God, in a huge way, gave us the greatest gift of all, his only son. As we know, what we call the American Revolution holds importance, and we will never forget it, or so we thought. Unfortunately, in much of today's society, young teens and even some young adults have unfortunately forgotten all the sweat, pain, blood, tears, and loved ones lost in battle that gave birth to the country we now enjoy. But God's gift was for everyone, for one time, and his plan is so amazing. If you remember at the beginning, I mentioned that the idea of looking to and knowing that something great lies beyond this life, well, this has to do with God's plan. Our second to last passage tonight comes from Isaiah. Flip over to Isaiah chapter 53. And you might know where I'm going with this. Look at verse 1 through 12. Isaiah 53, 1 through 12. It says, Who has believed what he has heard from us? And to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? He grew up before him like a young plant. Like a root out of dry ground, he had no form or majesty that we should look at him, and no beauty that we should desire him. He was despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief, and as one from whom men hide their faces. He was despised, and we esteemed him not. Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. Yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God, and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace. And with his wounds we are healed. We, all like sheep, have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed, and he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. Like a lamb that is led to the slaughter, like a sheep that before its shears is silent, so he opened not his mouth. By oppression and judgment he was taken away. And as for his generation, who considered that he was cut off out of the land of the living, stricken for the transgressions of my people? And they made his grave with the wicked and with a rich man in his death, although he had done no violence and there was no deceit found in his mouth. Yet it was the will of the Lord to crush him. He has put him to grief when his soul makes an offering for guilt. He shall see his offspring. He shall prolong his days. The will of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. Out of the anguish of his soul he shall see and be satisfied. By his knowledge shall the righteous one, my servant, make many to be accounted righteous. And he shall bear their iniquities. Therefore I will divide him a portion with the many. And he shall divide the spoil with the strong, because he poured out his soul to death and was numbered with the transgressions. Yet he bore the sins of many and makes intercession for transgressions. It was God's plan from the beginning to reconcile us back to him. Jesus was the fulfillment of that plan. Jesus broke down the barrier, and now because of that, we have direct access to our Father. All, all three points we looked over come together in one out of many ways can be looked at as a life of a Christian. While we have breath in our lungs, we are commanded to study, unite, and fight. It's also a life of a soldier to, con to connect this back to our analogy. Jesus sacrificed himself for us so that whoever believes in him might not perish but have eternal life. The last passage I have for us tonight is John 3:16 through 18. In John 3:16 through 18. It says, "For God so loved the world that he gave his only son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life." For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. Whoever believes in him is not condemned. 
For whoever does not believe is condemned already because he has not believed in the name of the only Son of God. We have an eternal victory in Jesus. And the b- battle has already been won. So we, Christians, in some way, are God's recruiters. Even after a war is fought, the military still recruits men. And so as it goes, if you're here tonight and you've listened and maybe something's pricked your heart and you now believe and you want to act on that belief through baptism, we, we would be happy to help. Just come forward and we'll help you get that done. But also, it's tough out there. You know, it, it's challenging and we all make mistakes from time to time. And so, we offer at this time those who are struggling to also come forward, ask for prayers or whatever you need may be. If there's anything you need, please let it be known as together we stand and sing. Thanks for listening. We'd be happy to answer any questions you have. If you are ever in the Colleen area, we'd certainly love to have you worship with us. You can learn more about us and our times of worship at westsidecolleen.com. Tune in next time and be sure to subscribe to our podcast. All together worthy, all together wonderful to me.